All right, now taking a gander at the two uh, gaskets here, it's obvious that this is the gasket that we're gonna reuse because that's for that bump out in that corner right there. So we're gonna discard this gasket. All right, that uh, old gasket is sticking to the pan. I don't think they used any gasket sealant on it, but I think it's just from being baked on there. So, amongst the things I grabbed to bring out here was a putty knife, which has now gone completely missing. What the heck? Oh, I went in before to grab another box of nitrile gloves because that box that I had open was almost empty. I put them down and had the putty knife with them and forgot about them. It's a door in the corner. That's really stuck on there. I'll take a good look, close look at this and see whether or not they used any sealant on this thing. Hmm. Wait a minute. No, it doesn't look like uh can't really tell. <coughs> I think it's just it's just being uh, old and caked on there. It's days like today, with little jobs like this, where I really come to appreciate this parts washer. It cleaned up really well. A lot of the paint or undercoating or whatever was on it is coming off with it. But the uh, point is, it's not going to be this really mess, messy, greasy thing I've got to handle while I put it back up into position. Ooh, I'm glad I didn't throw that other gasket into the trash yet. I left it hanging on the edge of the trash can, thinking that, well, just in case I have to return this, I don't want to have to dig that out of the trash. And... That gasket looked like it was the right gasket, but boy, I'll tell you, the filter, you know, when I first saw the, the metal bottom of this filter, I thought, well, maybe this opens up somehow when you put this element inside of this, but I don't see that happening. And so you got, it, it's just like a completely different deal. So am I supposed to replace this whole assembly with, this much inferior looking deal. I mean, it's got a hole there that lines up with what that hole is on there. But on this side, it's got this opening here. I don't like this. I'm gonna go, I'm taking that back to Napa and showing the guy and seeing what they come up with. Well, I'm glad I went back to the auto parts store and asked the counter guy what the other choice was that came up for my model year because he went and pulled out this kit, which is the, uh, 1-8565 filter kit and yeah, 42RE and this one actually says right on it 47RE okay and haha said so the actual gaskets are the same the difference is the filter that's my filter right there so without further ado uh, well actually I think before I put the filter in I'm gonna see whether or not um, I can get to that band adjustment. Maybe this filter is in the way when uh, of getting that adjustment done. Well, I actually don't see it. Huh. I'm going to go look at those pictures and refresh my memory. All right. I did see this adjustment with a lock nut on it. But I wanted to double check, and sure enough, that right there, right there, that's my adjustment. So first thing I gotta do is get I gotta get the right size socket to loosen that lock nut. You know, as if my luck wasn't bad enough. 
Take a look at that drip on the bottom of that lower ball joint. Uh, unfortunately, I know that all too well. It's either one or two things. It's either brake fluid leaking, which the lines and everything around the caliper look dry. So I'm afraid it's probably issue number two causing that kind of a drip, which would be the axle seal. And uh, I do not think I'm going to do that. I've had that job. I've had that repaired on my other Dodge that I ended up uh, getting rid of, the regular cab. And uh, that's not a fun job at all. And uh, I don't think I'm going to venture into that. But what it is, is there is a seal that's inboard over here where this axle tube goes into the side of the diff front differential here. And when that seal fails, the uh, gear oil in there will work its way out and run down and leak out there. You actually see where it was dripping on the tire and I uh, wiped it off when I first saw it, but there's another drip forming so I can see it's still leaking. All right, one thing at a time. We're uh, just loosening that. It's a 14 millimeter socket. So I'm going to back that off about five turns. All right, so here's what we got going here. I got a quarter inch socket. That fits on that uh, adjusting stud. Then I got an adapter to go to 3 8 and Then I got a small 3 8 extension so that I can use my, my lighter torque wrench, which I already preset to 72 inch pounds. Now I put a piece of painter's tape on here and I made two lines on that side and exactly opposite I made one line. And that's so I'm gonna be able to gauge when I need to back this off the three turns or whatever it is that the the instruction set, I'll be able to gauge exactly how many times I've turned it. So one thing that gives me pause is how loose that thing was. I mean, I could just rattle that bracket like nothing. It was way loose. So I'm kind of shocked. I, you know, it kind of makes me feel a little leery about this whole procedure. I guess I shouldn't have worried about that uh, being loose because what happens is uh, it must be by design. Uh, when you torque it down to the 72 inch pounds, and then you back it off the three full turns, it goes back to being loose and sloppy. So it must be that it's accounting for the fact that that all tightens up once it's uh, actually working on the load or whatever. So now I'm going to just lock down the uh, outer lock nut to uh, 30 foot pounds. So I've changed to my bigger torque wrench for that. Oh, so anyways, after cleaning up the pan, I realized that this uh, donut shaped magnet basically, it just basically sits in the bottom here sticks to the pan and there's this bump right here to keep it from moving around I guess but I cleaned that up and there weren't any metal chips on it it was just a really fine fine slurry that was on there so I think that's a good sign all right so I was installing a new filter and uh, I was just tightening the uh, screws for starters by hands using that Torx bit I had on that extension and of course I dropped it right into the bucket of fluid so I'm going to use the magnet here to hopefully fish for it. Well, there's the tip. Okay, now I'm ready to install the pan. I've put the new gasket on and uh, I've reinstalled the magnet. And one of the things that's great about this rubber gasket is that it's snug enough that I can push a bolt up through a hole and it will actually keep the bolt in place. So what I've done is I've put in four bolts just to keep this gasket in alignment. So I can put the pan up and get those bolts started and then that way I, my gasket will stay aligned and I don't have to worry about uh, dealing with lining up those holes or having the gasket get out of position. Right up behind this fitting here is where that other adjustment is, the front band adjustment. I'm going to do that off camera because I can't hold the camera while doing it. But you want to disconnect this spring from this end and that will give you room to get to that. Whew, well, it's already, the sun is setting. Uh, ran out of time today to uh, finish up everything. I just put in some fluid, but I didn't buy enough fluid. I only bought five quarts uh, of transmission fluid. And then I checked the uh, capacity of the transmission system on the in the owner's manual. It actually says 17 quarts, but yeah, that does include, it says it includes the torque converter. So in other words, if you uh, just do a regular drain and filter, a lot of fluid might stay in the torque converter. And then also there's the uh, the lines and 
the transmission oil cooler, which is up in the way up in the front here, the entire volume of that, the volume of the lines. I'm assuming maybe they're including that in that 17 quarts. So I put in the uh, put in the five quarts, and I've got a pretty good level on the dipstick, but I haven't started the motor yet. So now I've got to start it up and uh, go through the procedure of getting the fluid circulating through the system. All right, so basically what you want to do is you want to start the motor, let it run for a little bit, and then uh, with your foot on the brake or with the parking brake on, you want to shift through all of the gears, reverse, into drive, into low one, low two, back up, go back and forth a couple of times. And what, that's, what that does is that's going to open and close all those different valves in the valve body and get fluid flowing through all the different um, hydraulic circuits in the transmission. Alright, so now I've warmed it up a little longer. I'm going to run it through the gears one more time. Then I go back to neutral and apply the parking brake. And what that does is that allows the fluid to keep circulating through the transmission. Now I'm going to check the fluid level. low, pretty low in the dipstick right there, way down, way down here, that's not good, so we have to get some more fluid tomorrow. Alright, it's been a couple of days, I finally got around to picking up the rest of the fluids, I can finish topping off the uh, transmission fluid and test drive this, this Dodge, and uh, I just want to take a moment to talk about how oh, let me start by saying that uh, I had five quarts in there, it was too low. I picked up two more quarts. I just put in the sixth quart. And what I want to do is I want to talk about the, uh, the two different levels on the uh, dipstick here. Because there's a level for hot and there's a level for um, warm. Now, you can't check the level when it's cold. This has been sitting for two days now and the engine's completely cold. Everything's cold. If I put the dipstick in there right now, it's going to look like it's overfilled, but that's not the proper way to check the level. The proper way to check the level is as I already outlined. You warm the engine up for at least 60 seconds, you run it through all of the gears a couple of times, put it back into neutral with the parking brake on, and check the level at that point. Oh, it helps if I turn it around so it's facing the right way. All right, so here on the dipstick we have, uh, you can actually see there's a uh, MIN for minimum, and there's a little circle right there, and then uh, there's a cross-hatched area right here. So the uh, cross-hatched area, that area right there is the normal range for hot. If the fluid is hot, that means if the fluid's over 180 degrees Fahrenheit, which is typical operating temperature if the vehicle's been driven over 15 miles. Okay, so we're not going to check it hot. The check for warm, which means that we ran the uh, engine at curb idle speed for at least 60 seconds and then ran it through the, uh, the gears a couple of times. Uh, that's actually, it says in the uh, manual, between the two holes. But the reality is that uh, what they're talking about is they're talking about uh, this little circle right here that it can't be below that circle. So we ideally want to be between that little circle and somewhere at the low end of this cross hatch area. So let's uh, start it up and warm it up. Alright, it's been a couple minutes. Sometimes you gotta roll it over to the other side.
All right, right now it's just above that little circle. So I'm going to put a little more in. That's better. If anything, that might be just a little bit high, but I'll check it again when it's hot. I put in half the quart, brought it up to uh, three quarters of the way up on that crosshack section more the range for hot. Good to go.